Hi, um, I'm Deirdre Sullivan and I am very privileged to be speaking today with Sheena Wilkinson, a writer that the Irish Times has referred to as one of our foremost writers for young people. Since the publication of the internationally multi-award winning Taking Flight in 2010, Sheena has been established as one of the most acclaimed Irish writers for young people. In 2012, Sheena was granted a major award from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, its highest award given to artists of national and international importance. In both 2019 and 2020, she was nominated for the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award, the world's largest children's literature award. Sheena's novels have been praised for their handling of difficult subjects, from suicide and sexual exploitation to cultural identity and post-conflict trauma. Her seventh novel, Star by Star, shortlisted for the BGE Irish Book Awards, winner of a CBI Honour Award for Fiction and one of only five titles designated a future classic in Book Trust's 2018 School Library Pack, was published to commemorate the centenary of the 1918 um, Representation of the People Act. The Irish Times called it pitch perfect and Fallen Star Stories called it a brilliant and bold novel. It is publisher Little Island's best-selling book ever, selling just over 25,000 copies. Hope Against Hope, set in a cross-community girls' hostel against the background of Irish partition in 1921, has just been published and was described in the Irish Times as a moving and clever novel that expertly depicts how the big political concerns of the day um, impact on individual lives. Sheena, welcome. I'm delighted to be talking to you today. Deirdre, it's lovely to be talking to you and thank you so much and thank you for that very generous introduction. Oh sure, it's all true, Sheena. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true, but it's, yeah, thank you. And it's all great and so is this wonderful book. Um, and I believe you have a section that you'd be happy to read. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah. So Hope Against Hope, as Deirdre said, is set in 1921 against the background of Irish partition. And it follows a young girl of 15 called Polly, who runs away to a hostel in Belfast to escape really from a quite a violent situation at home. And she imagines that it will be like going to a boarding school, but the reality is very different. Helen's Hope is sort of a progressive feminist space where young women live and work together, but they are very much the object of suspicion in a Belfast which is very fractured, very divided and very violent. So this is Polly's first night in the hostel and she's meeting people from, from all over the place. I suppose you're a Fenian like your cousin, Ivy said in a resigned voice. Ivy! Tessa sounded shocked. We're not meant to ask. We can't ask, Ivy said. We're just not meant to mind. For goodness sake, who cares, Tessa said. Sure, we're all just one happy family here at Helen's Hope. Living together, working together, learning together, she said in a sing-song voice. You know what Stella says. I tried not to think about Stella being hurt. Catherine's told me a bit about Helen's Hope, I said, but not exactly what it is. Depends who you ask, Tessa said. My ma thinks it's respectable lodgings to keep us away from bad boys. She grinned and Catherine blushed. Cassie thinks it's a place to drum some learning into us. She used to be a teacher. You can tell by the look of her, can't you? Ivy said. Stella thinks it's an experiment in modern living and it's going to change the world. Tessa rolled her eyes and giggled. I didn't like them making fun of Stella. When junior girls in school stories criticised the head girl, they always turned out to be the baddies. I didn't want to throw my lot in with baddies before I found out what the other girls were like. One thing to go to the bad myself, another to be dragged there by girls I wasn't sure about. Reverend Hamill from the Presbyterian Church thinks it's a den of iniquity full of girls who are no better than they should be, Tessa went on. And God knows what the Catholic priest thinks, Catherine joined in for the first time. Who cares, Ivy said. Och, it's not bad, Tessa said. They go on a lot about tolerance and understanding. So is it like school? Not really, Tessa said. There's a sewing factory for girls to learn a trade and make a bit of money. But some of us just go out to work and lodge here. I'm at a lemonade factory, Tessa sighed. It's awful boring. Then she perked up. 
I don't like putting lab labels on lemonade bottles and I hate the troubles in the city. But I love the picture houses and the music hall. She started to sing, the boy I love is up in the gallery. I couldn't help giggling. Are you allowed to go to music halls and picture houses and cafes? I asked. Tessa stopped singing. Not exactly, but a girl can hope. Thank you so much. That was You're really welcome. good. Um, and even listening to it, um, I'm kind of reminded of your mastery of character. Like every bit of dialogue there does some heavy lifting in terms of telling us who people are, what their role in the story will be. But it's all um, like you can't see the kind of the puppeteering going on. It's so <laughs> <skillful>. <laughs> Good. I'm really jealous. <laughs> I do. Um, the, these three historical novels. So there's Name Upon Name, which is about the um, Easter Rising. I'm going to do a bit of product placement here if I can get it into the frame. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and then there's Star by Star, which you mentioned, which is about women voting in 1918 and also about the the Spanish flu pandemic. I'm not very good at getting these books. Oh, here we go, here we go. And then uh, <laughs> Hope Against Hope. They're all um, actually quite short novels. Yeah. Um, so it's, I try really hard to make every word work really, really hard for its living. So normally my first drafts are quite long and then I cut, 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 cut away all the crap right. until I get to what I really want to say. Yeah, so kind of it's nearly um, in the editorial process that it takes that. Very that much so, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm quite happy about writing a first draft that's really rough and really mm -hmm. often in a first draft I find I'm kind of telling myself the story and sometimes I need to tell myself the story three times in three different ways and then mm -hmm. when I look at what I've written then I realise I've done that and I'll just, as I say, cut and cut and yeah. and let let the story and the words really kind of shine through yeah and would those first drafts would they be for you or would you be like would you kind of share them would it be at second draft stage before you'd be ready to Ooh. ask for any feedback i would die if anyone saw my first draft <laughs> i know the feeling <laughs> yeah no the first draft is a very very private draft um yes nobody nobody sees my first drafts mm -hmm. uh by the time i have one i have a really good friend called suzanne who's um she's not a published writer although she does actually write very well but she's a really really good reader and we love all the same things so quite often i let her see it at a pretty rough stage mm -hmm. but mostly i will edit and edit and edit however many drafts that might take and by the time i send it to my editor at Little Island it's it would be at least a fourth or a fifth draft yeah I kind of find with my work I edit as I go yeah so kind of I you know kind of would start reread fix so by the time I get to the end of the first draft it's probably closer to a second yeah. or third yeah. Yeah. but even still it's not it's not for other people yeah. Yeah. um the uh, Hope Against Hope is your um, ninth book, um, including your nonfiction, which I have oh here. My from the court. You're one of like about 20 people in the world that's actually bought that yeah. book. <laughs> oh, no, you told me about it, and I was like, I have to read this. Um, <laughs> but uh, I imagine that it's. Um, and it's actually, if people did enjoy Hope Against Hope, it's um, it's a really great read. It's about boarding school novels. Um, oh, it's fabulous. Um, but I imagine that the release of Hope Against Hope was a little bit different to that of your other books. Um, even though I know, I know you made it to the launch in Noelle Vice. Um, yeah. But uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about how COVID nineteen has impacted your work? Yeah, it's it was weird. Um, obviously, I had a lot of events lined up for Hope Against Hope, um, Little Island, my pub wonderful publishers, and uh, and various kind of schools and things were were all kind of lined up for me to do quite a lot of events. And obviously, none of those events happened. It became clear, really, from the start of March that things yeah. were going to 
things were not going to work out the way we hoped. Um, we did just about squeeze in a book launch on the on World Book Day, which is publication day on the 5th of March. Fabulous. And looking back now, you know, it, I, I just feel so lucky that, that we are able to, to have a book launch. Um, so, yeah, it's been a weird time. Obviously, bookshops have been closed, although they've opened this week, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. To be honest, given the situation the world is in, I'm you know, worrying about a book not getting as much attention as it might otherwise have had is it's a pretty small mm-hmm. worry in the great scheme of things. So I'm just I'm grateful that the book is out there. I'm grateful that it was published on time. The book is like all my historical novels was written for a particular centenary in this case the centenary of the partition of ireland in 1921 and the setting up of northern ireland so mm-hmm. it's my hope that actually the book will get yeah. some attention next year when hopefully yeah, things are, are back to normal star by star was published in 2017 but because it commemorated the events of 1918 most of the events I did for it were in 2018. So I'm really hoping that Hope Against Hope will kind of keep on giving in the way that Star did. No, absolutely. And you're um, like, they're historical novels, but they are, they're quite timeless. Like, um, I'm not surprised that Book Trust did designate it a future classic um, because it feels like the kind of book I could, you know, I could have picked it up as a child. Yeah. You know, like, it kind of it it has that um that Heidi energy or something you know like where you're kind of like I feel that people will be reading it decades from now um that's lovely I hope so I love that um I love that sense of a a timeless kind of particularly historical novel um I grew up with among among many many other sorts of novels, um, I grew up with the the books of K. M. Payton and her Flambard's books were a particular love of mine and probably a particular influence on me. And I don't think you would have guessed reading those books when they were written. They were actually written in the in the the late sixties, um, early seventies. But I don't think you would really guess that. I mm-hmm. think because there's so much that they're, they they to me, they evoke their 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 period, which is the early twentieth century, um, so vividly. So I kind of try to do the same thing. But having said that, all books are produced in the time when they are produced, and obviously, I came of age when I came of age, and I there are a lot of things in the book which resonate. I hope in a timeless way, but also I hope resonate particularly at the moment. There's a lot about. Um, about sort of female spaces, about uh, about tolerance, about diversity, about suspicion. Um, all of those things are, I suppose that they're they're timeless, but they are also, I think, particularly relevant at the moment. So I yeah. hope that uh, yeah, I hope that people read it now, and, and I hope they continue to read it. Um, this kind of brings me on quite nicely to my next question. Um, Hope Against Hope deals with a range of difficult issues. Um, The troubles, homelessness, PTSD, Spanish flu, death, domestic violence, to name but a few. But it wears its politics lightly. And the deft way in which you explored um, quite complex subject matter in an accessible manner, um, but without oversimplification, really struck me. Um, You don't talk down to the reader at all. Um, what What was at the core of the book for you? I've thought a lot about this, Deirdre, because, as you say, there's there's quite a lot happening in the book, mm-hmm. mainly because 1921, like 1918 and 1916, and probably many years in Irish history, was such a difficult and complex time. So I thought, well, what really is at the core of the book? And I think for me, it is, it is that sense of community. It is that sense of um, of a young woman finding her place within a community and within both within her family and then within the community of Helen's Hope and yes. then within the wider community because all of these books are about young women coming of age against political and social upheaval and that's kind of at the, the heart of all my historical fiction so I'd say mm-hmm. that sense of, of community and finding your place in the world is, is probably and 
and that is timeless yeah um and that's like that's really interesting and a lot of the kind of um you do kind of walk a very interesting line between the personal and the political and a lot of your heroines find themselves in order to achieve personal fulfillment stepping into their politics stepping into an awareness of who they are and a comfort in standing up for what they believe in. Um, yeah. That's then, yeah. Oh, carry on. Um, Polly shares a world and a desire to affect positive change with Helen and Stella from Star by Star and Name Upon Name, but she's very much her own character as well. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about Polly in Hope Against Hope and how you developed her as a narrator? Yeah, it's, should I share this? Yes, I will share this. When I first wrote the book, there was a completely different character as the main mm -hmm. character, a character who no longer even exists. Um, oh, wow. it, yeah, I know. And it just, it just wasn't working. Oh, Sheena, um, that must have been so hard. And I was at a pretty late stage when mm -hmm. I realised with, with the help of my editor, that it wasn't working with this other character at the at the heart of it. So it was very much back to the drawing board. And that's really where Polly came from. I realized that what I hadn't foregrounded enough in the book was partition. Yeah. So I moved the main character and I placed her in a little border town, which meant that the border literally kind of ripped her her home yes. too. And once I had that, then it became much, much easier to find Polly as a character. And she, oh, it's funny, all, all three characters, Helen and Stella and Polly, as you say, they're all very different from each other. Helen is, is quite conflicted and sort of reticent. Stella is very bold and feisty and very sure of herself. Polly is probably somewhere in between. She's very mm. confused about all kinds of things. Um, she's hot-tempered, um, strong-minded, but not a very clear thinker. And she makes mm. some pretty, pretty bad mistakes in the book. And because of the times in which she is living, those mistakes can have pretty devastating consequences for mm. other people. The funny thing about Polly is a lot of people say, say she's the most like me of, of any of my characters. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, because I think it's very difficult to see ourselves. Yes. But she probably, I think Stella is who I might have liked to be at 15. Mm -hmm. And Polly is probably closer to what I was actually like. <laughs> I also give her frizzy hair because I've got frizzy hair and nobody in books ever has frizzy hair well the heroines don't anyway so i give her i give her really frizzy hair that is as as a fellow like curly frizzy haired person <laughs> i like that um because you always get like these perfect ringlets and it's like no that yeah. doesn't just happen no. you know um the historical novels um your historical novels always ring so true to me on a human level but also yeah. in terms of the world building. Yeah. The texture of them is different. The world feels lived in. Um, and I know that your PhD involved boarding school novels and that you have a particular interest in er the early 20th century. Can you tell us a little about the research process for um, a book like Hope Against Hope? Yeah, so this is my third novel set around this time, the kind of uh, sort of second and, and into the third decade of the 20th century and I've as you say I I do know quite a bit about the school stories of this era and um, it's it's always been an area that an era that has fascinated me and so by the time I'm writing Hope Against Hope the third novel set at this time I'm fairly confident about sort of people's attitudes at the time how they lived what they wore all of those things and nowadays it's it's very easy to find those things out. Um, obviously, I do research online, but I prefer books because there's just something really 
lovely and solid about about reading about yeah, a book. Yeah, it's nice to be able to underline something, you know. Oh, I wouldn't dream of underlining something in a book. Oh my no. god! Oh my god! No, no, no. But I do post it. I do post it. Um, I do post um, some things and bookmarks and that sort of thing. But uh, um, I, um, yeah, my uh, I'm never lending you a book, Deirdre. <laughs> don't I have like um my next one isn't like it's kind of um it's a retelling of the children of Lear so no. while it's not necessarily grounded in like history it is very yeah. much grounded in legend and lore and there is a lot of research but I've got like a shelf of books and they're like I would imagine to your eyes probably destroyed <laughs> <laughs> yes, <it did. laughs> yeah yeah, I yeah no, I, I don't underline things in books, but I do read a lot of books. But I also love going to museums, and um, particularly folk museums, where you can, you know, go into reconstructions of old houses and that kind of thing. I really, really love that. Um, and then this book, more than my other historical fiction, I think evokes Belfast at that time, or at least I, I hope evokes Belfast at that time. So. I spent a lot of time walking around Belfast and um, mm. looking up very often with Belfast. If you look above the shop front, so you can see what was there in Victorian yes. times and Edwardian times, but also just walking around little streets. Um, my granny, I mean, obviously she, she, you know, she died a long time ago, but she would have been in 1921, she would have been 13. She'd have been a little bit young to be at Helen's Hope, but she did live just around the corner from Helen's Hope. And oh, I wow. obviously didn't put her into the book, but there's a scene in the book where a lot of local children come to a garden party in the in the garden of Helen's Hope. And I do like to imagine that had there been a real Helen's Hope, that my granny might have been one of the children having a three legged race or or learning a folk dance or or something like that. So I'm really glad that the world feels lived in to you because I'm really passionate about making sure that historical fiction that I write it's not just about getting the details right about what happened when and um what they wore but it, it is also kind of the tone their attitudes and that kind of thing that can be much harder to get right yeah but, but um, I think you that, feel you've got it wrong that's what really I think impressed me because like particularly in terms of polysexuality um and kind of dealing with issues say like I mean kind of that we would have a different frame of reference and yeah. different vocabulary to express now. Um, but for a long time, um, people were denied that unless they were in certain kind of, in certain circles, you know, where yeah. there were their own slang or, you know, but like a little girl in a border town in Northern Ireland was not going to know that she could identify as a lesbian. Absolutely. And, you know, and I thought that that was so well handled. Yeah, I think because I read a lot of books written at the time, and I think because in my, for my study for my PhD, which was about, as you say, um, about boarding school and college novels um, of the 20th century, I, I knew a lot about, I suppose, the language around all sorts of relationships, you know, um, romantic relationships, sexual relationships, friendship relationships. And I knew that a girl like Polly, who has got some feelings about other girls that she doesn't really understand or necessarily have language to to talk about. Yeah. There's no way that she would think about that in the way that a young woman coming of age today would think about it. So I had to be really careful that I didn't use language or 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 a confidence or or even a self consciousness that wouldn't have been that wouldn't have been normal at the time because a lot of Polly's feelings about other girls would have been considered quite appropriate at the time. Yeah. I mean, if you read the school stories of people like Angela Brazil or Elsie Oxenham, they're quite unselfconscious about women, young women expressing quite passionate feelings for each other. So yeah, I'd, stop like, short, yeah. Yeah, I'd stop short of saying, you know, Polly is a lesbian, but she doesn't have the, the words to say that because I don't know you know who knows who knows who Polly will grow up to to love yeah. or or not love certainly the feelings that she has for other girls particularly for Stella yeah. um who who quite clearly is a lesbian um mm -hmm. 
they they confuse her but they don't they don't trouble her too much i don't think um and i think one of the things she learns is that women women can love each other and whether yeah. she grows up to love other women i don't know um yeah. i know that stella does yeah and i think that that's something um that we don't because queer history does get kind of swept under the rug a lot mm. and kind of i cannot think of a book i encountered as a young adult that you know apart from the odd boarding school novel with a pash you know yeah, yeah. um that would have that would have dealt with that and i just i kind of it was it was one aspect of the book that really i suppose struck me as something that might re you know just be incredibly meaningful for someone to encounter by itself yeah. with all of the layers of story of character you know all of the yeah. wonderful other things that you have done because i think that seeing oneself in in fiction can feel a lot like coming home to a young reader yeah yeah mm -hmm. well yeah i was and i was like you know like polly maybe not at polly's age but probably when i was a bit younger um, but you know, I had I had crushes on other girls at school, mm. but then I I grew up to you know to to fall in love with men, um, mm. and I I quite like that kind of I quite like the fact that I haven't that I've been fairly open about it and fairly yeah. you know it's 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 not it's central to the story, but Polly's feelings are central to the story, but whatever her sexual identity turns out to be, um, is is not really relevant. No um it's it's part of who she is but not all of it exactly yeah um yeah. and it's that's not it's kind of a little side quest it's not the main journey that she no, takes no. in hope against hope um i was wondering if you were to write a book set in another time in history mm -hmm. sheena do you know when it would be um that's a really good question. It's quite a tough question. Um, I, I think it would probably have to be the 20th century. I do, um, I do love writing about the early 20th century. I think I love the kind of history that you feel you can sort of almost reach out and touch. Yes. Rather than very, very sort of distant history. And I'm, I, I'm full of admiration for people who can like, like Deirdre, I've I've had a a, a sneak preview at, at a proof of uh, of your children of Lear retelling, oh. and I have real um, admiration for somebody who can reach out to something a time which is so distant mm. and and evoke it so clearly. And I I don't think that I could do that. I'm I'm really interested in. I love things like you know um, TV programs like you know, back in time for dinner and, you know, back in time yeah. for the corner shop. I love sort of social history and the, um, the history of sort of real things and, and, and what people wore and, and the magazines they had, all that kind of thing, that yeah. very sort of um, tangible history. So maybe because of that, um, I, I feel much more at home with the, the more recent past. Um, yeah. I'd love to write a teen novel set in Ireland in the 50s or 60s around the time of, you know, everyone going out to the dances and the show bands and all that kind of thing. Um, basically, I, I love 20th century history, so there's no period that I would kind of rule out. Um, yes. At the moment, I'm writing an adult novel, which is set in 1933, um, where the main character is a 30-year-old Stella. Oh, wow! I know! <laughs> Sheena, can I have it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's at the stage of not being fit to show anybody at the moment, but when it's fit to show people, then absolutely. Oh, it sounds gorgeous. Um, we are kind of zooming out of time, but um, I just want to thank you so, so much for oh, chatting. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, thank you for your very thoughtful questions. <laughs>